Okay then, so this time we're going to have a look at one-dimensional projections. These are projections from a range of points on a line to a range of points on a line. And by classifying and understanding these objects, we're going to gain a lot more understanding of relationships between projections and harmonic sets. And we're going to see some even more ways to look at those things. And we're also going to introduce some more concepts like involutions, which turn out to be rather fundamental in projective geometry. So we're looking at projectivities from a range of points on a line to itself. And we're interested in classifying them. So how can we sort these different mappings into families? Well, one important thing to bear in mind is axiom 6 from our initial axioms of projective geometry which I think we discussed in FPG 6 sorry FPG 3 I think yes FPG 3 was discussion of axioms and number 6 was if we have a projectivity from a line to itself and that projectivity has at least three invariant points, then every point on that line is invariant under this projectivity. So, in other words, for any given point on our line, we can ask, is this point invariant? In other words, is this point just getting mapped back to itself under our projectivity? And if the answer is yes for three or more points, then the answer must be yes for every point. And in that case, our mapping is simply the identity. It just sends every point to itself. So given this information, we have that if a projectivity is not invariant, if it's not totally boring, then it must have either 0, 1, or 2 invariant points. And so we organize our projectivities into families according to uh, this quality. So, in particular, we call projectivities with zero invariant points, elliptic projectivities. We call one-dimensional projectivities with one invariant point, parabolic projectivities. And we call projectivities with two invariant points, hyperbolic projectivities. And hyperbolic projectivities have the most possible invariant points without being the identity mapping. So you might wonder where these names come from. They're obviously names of conic sections and a good way to think of it is that ellipses don't go to infinity. If we think about the conics in, in Euclidean space Ellipses, like circles and such, don't have any points at infinity. They don't go to infinity at any direction. Analogously, elliptical projectivities don't have any invariant points. Now, parabolic conics, par parabola in the ordinary Euclidean space, go to infinity in one direction. And analogously, uh, parabolic projectivities have one invariant point and to complete it then um, hyperbola in the Euclidean kind of conic sense go to infinity in two directions and a hyperbolic projectivity has two invariant points so that's where the naming convention comes from so it's just a way to help you remember the different names of these different kinds of projectivities. So an interesting question then is, how do you construct these different kinds of projectivities? So I'm going to show you how we can construct either hyperbolic or parabolic projectivities. So the way we're going to do this is by having a look at some projectivities that send points AEC to 
B, D, C, where A, B, C, D, E are different points on a on a line. Okay, and um, so we're going to have a look at how to construct those different mappings. Now, a very interesting question that I urge you to have a look at for yourself is how to construct elliptic projectivities. Now, it's not immediately obvious that elliptic projectivities exist in all cases. It turns out, in fact, that they do exist if we're looking at this kind of um, projective plane as an extension of the Euclidean plane, this standard kind of projective plane setting. In that setting, you can create elliptical projectivities, and I'll leave it up to you to see if you can do one. That's a projectivity from the line to itself that has no fixed points whatsoever. So see if you can do that. Um, I'll give you a clue. The clue is that, unlike the things I'm just going to show you, you actually need to string together more than two perspectivities to achieve an elliptical projectivity. But anyway, let's, um, I'll leave that as an exercise for you and I'll go on to discussing parabolic and hyperbolic projectivities. So clearly, if I can send the points A, E, C to the point B, D, C as a projectivity, that's going to be a one-dimensional projectivity and it's going to have one invariant point C and possibly more. So it's either going to be a parabolic or hyperbolic projectivity or the identity. But you'll see by the construction that it won't be the identity. Now, the curious thing about this construction is it's actually pretty much the same as the construction we did before when we were discussing quadrangular sets and how to complete a quadrangular set. So, if you recall a quadrangular set is what you get if you have a complete quadrangle and you look at the section of that complete quadrangle by a generic line that doesn't pass through any of the initial four vertices. So, you draw a line um, somewhere over your complete quadrangle figure and you see where this line cuts through all the different edges and you put a dot on your line wherever it, it intersects with one of the edges and you look at how those dots are spaced and those, those dots on that new line you've drawn form a quadrangular set. That's the definition of it. So we looked at this interesting problem of given five points A, B, C, D, E how can you find the fifth point sorry the sixth point F to complete a quadrangular set. And in fact, it turns out that our construction of these parabolic or hyperbolic projectivities is really reliant on that similar kind of um, idea. So I think it's pretty much the same, even the labeling. So we start off with five collinear points, A, B, C, D, E. And then we'll add an extra point S somewhere off the line. And we'll draw three lines through S. One that passes through A, one that passes through B, and one that passes through C. This is a construction method I'm talking about now. So that gives us three lines of our, well, the complete quadrangle that we're essentially making. And what we do next is we rule a line through D which is like the opposite edge of the quadrangle to the line that we drew through A. And you see that that now defines two points on this quadrangle. So we've already got a point S, and we can define point R as the place where CS meets this newly drawn line through D. And we can define point Q as the place where BS meets this newly drawn line through D. And actually now we're pretty much finished because if we draw another line which is opposite to the line we drew through B in the 
quadrang complete quadrangle focused sense. Um, that'll be a line through E and R. So if we draw that extra line through E and R, that'll define the fourth point of our quadrangular set, P. So now we have P, Q, R and S generate this complete quadrangle and lines through these lines of this quadrangle um, give us the points A, B, C and D. And we also find now that by looking at where this extra line, which is generated by this quadrang complete quadrangle, um, this extra line through P and Q meets our initial horizontal line AB, well that gives us an extra point F, which is the sixth point of our quadrangular set. And um, we can also, so we have this line that goes down to cut the initial horizontal line to form point F, and we can also define this extra point U, which is going to be useful to talk about later. We don't have to worry about it too much now, but we'll let U be the point on this new line that makes F, and also on the line RS. So U turns out to be fairly important when we're going to be looking at whether C and F are actually coincident or whether they're distinct points. The position of U will tell us about that. But we're not going to think too much about that now. The important thing here is that what we actually have, if you look at this carefully, is a means to create a projectivity from AEC to BDC. So in particular, if you look at points AEC and then consider what happens if you do a perspectivity of those three points with origin of perspective P. Well, in that case, you find that A goes to S and E goes to R and C is invariant. So, by using perspectivity point P, we can send AEC to SRC. Now, to complete our projectivity, we want to do another perspectivity to get back onto that horizontal line again. So we'll complete the job using center of perspectivity Q. And then we can send S to B, R to D, and we can leave C invariant again. So stringing this all together then, the combination of these two perspectivities using points P and Q respectively is going to be a projectivity which sends us from points A, E, C to B, D, C. Okay, so provided that A is not the same as B and D is not the same as E, this mapping is not going to be the identity. But we know it has at least one invariant point. We know that C is an invariant point under this projectivity. So it follows then that if um, C is the only invariant point, then this is going to be a parabolic projectivity. Whereas if there's another invariant point, then it must be a hyperbolic projectivity. So what other point could be invariant? Well, if you have a look, the only other candidate is going to be point F, because that's on the same line as the line that goes through P and Q, which are the two points we used as centers of perspectivity in creating this projection. So F is also going to be an invariant point. So the question of whether this is a parabolic or hyperbolic projection is pretty much analogous to the question of whether C and F are actually the same point or not. So if we consider the case where C and F are the same point, what, what's happening in that case? Well, in that case, 
we only have one invariant point under this projectivity and so it must be a parabolic projectivity and we can write it as AECC uh, gets projected to BDCC now the reason for that notation is that if we consider the more general case where B and sorry where C and F are different well then it's going to be a hyperbolic projectivity that only has one invariant point C and it's just going to be a projectivity from AECF to BDCF excuse me um, in the latter case it's going to have two invariant points C and F that's in the hyperbolic case in the first case I was discussing the parabolic case it only has one invariant point C which is kind of um, essentially you can think of a parabolic case as like the hyperbolic case but with the two invariant points coincident upon one another when the C and F happen to occur in the same place so actually there's only one invariant point for the parabolic case so we can see how to construct these two special different kinds of mappings and we can see how this is related to the whole notion of quadrangular sets and also we can look at this point U here and hopefully you can see that when this point U is actually part of the horizontal line AB in that case we're going to have our parabolic projectivity because in that case C and F are going to be the same whereas more generally because, C, because essentially U is one of the diagonal points of our complete quadrangle um, whereas more generally of course U is not going to be part of that line and so more generally we'll, if we just did things randomly we'd end up generating a hyperbolic projectivity almost certainly um, where C and F are distinct and U is not part of that line AB so we can summarize what we've found out by hearkening back to the old notation A, D, B, E, C, F which are the three pairs which denote our quadrangular set and so what we've found out is that in fact having this projectivity from A, E, C, F to B, D, C, F, where A, B, C, D, E, F is six, six uh, points on a line, well, that's possible if and only if A, D, B, E, C, F forms a quadrangular set. Those three pairs together form a quadrangular set. And this result holds when C and F are distinct. That's the case of a hyperbolic projectivity but it also holds when C and F are equal to each other. That's the parabolic projectivity case. So it's interesting then that we have this new way of describing quadrangular sets, which are really very fundamental objects in projective geometry. And also, if you look at this case of the um, projectivities, you see that C and F really play symmetric roles and so what that actually means is that whenever we have the, the three pairs AD, BE and CF form a quadrangular set well that actually implies that AD, BE, FC form a quadrangular set in other words we can switch around the order of the appearance of um, a pair of points in our quadrangular set notation and it doesn't you know it still remains true as a statement so um, this is quite a remarkable result because we already noted some there were already some implications to do with relabeling uh, which we, we, for example, we showed that when we had A, D, B, E, C, F, then we have these three pairs, and we already showed that we could switch around the order of a couple of pairs simultaneously, 
and that would again yield a true statement because it would correspond to just relabeling the points of the quadrangle P, Q, R and S with P, Q, R, S in a different order possibly permuting the vertex labels. Um, so we already found out that we're allowed to switch around the order of two pairs in this notation. Now it turns out we're actually allowed to switch around the order of one pair in this notation as well. So we now have that we're allowed to do this operation and we're also, as we showed before, allowed to switch around the order within which these three pairs appear. And so it turns out that we also have that A, D, B, E, C, F, it's a quadrangular set, implies that A, D, E, B, C, F is a quadrangular set and that D, A, B, E, C, F is a quadrangular set. So any of these three switches of a order of a single pair of elements is, is allowed and it still yields a true description of a quadrangular set. Okay then, so let's talk some more about how to make hyperbolic or parabolic projectivities. So, in particular, uh, I want to show you that a hyperbolic projectivity is specified uniquely by giving its two invariant points as well as another point A and its image B. So the reason why that's true is the fundamental theorem of projective geometry, which we've proved before, which states that given any distinct three points, which are collinear, and their distinct images under a projectivity, that uniquely specifies how every point of that line is going to be mapped by the projectivity. In other words, the projectivity is specified by giving three distinct points and the three images of those points, provided the first three points are collinear, that is. So, what that means, for example, is given that A maps to B, and given that C maps to C and F maps to F, that's enough information to uniquely specify our projectivity. So those three pieces of info uniquely specify a hyperbolic projectivity. Okay, but can we always construct one given a generic triple of points, A, B, sorry, quadruple of points, A, B, C, and F. So A goes to B, and C goes to C and F goes to F. Well, yes we can. Um, one way to do it is if we start off by, well, we start off with these points on a line, A, B, C, D, F, and then we'll draw three lines, one through A, one through B, and one through F, and those form a triangle with points P, Q, and S. So, in particular, we'll, we'll uh, specify these so that the line through S and P also goes through point A, and the line through S and Q all goes, also goes through point B, and the line through P and Q also goes through point F. So we can, we can do that just by drawing these three lines, generically, that cut A, B, and F. And that makes our triangle, which gives us our three points, P, Q, and S. And now to finish the job, well, we can specify another point, R. And that will complete our quadrangular set. And we find R just by joining the lines Q and D to the line, drawing the line through Q and D to the line through C and S. And that will lead to a construction which is somewhat similar to the one we had before. But actually, we can, we can step back a little bit because we don't actually need that fourth point to, oh yes we do, excuse me. Um, yes, we need to create all these points before we can discuss our projectivity. So, 
now we've got our four points, P, Q, R, and S, of our the four vertices that generate our complete quadrangle. And what remains is to find this diagonal point called U. So U is just going to be the diagonal point where the line PQ and the line RS meet each other. And so now what we find out is that if we start by doing a perspectivity with center of perspectivity P from points ACF, we can send those to points SCU respectively. And then a second perspectivity via center Q will send SCU to BCF. So that essentially does our job and achieves our desired hyperbolic projectivity, which has fixed points C and F and has point A corresponding to point B. So we found out that two invariant points and a other point together with its image are enough to specify a hyperbolic projectivity. And also, the parabolic projectivity then, we can see that that's just a special case of this, where that diagonal point U actually happens to lie on the horizontal line AB. So, in other words, in this special case where C, F and U all coincide, in that case we have a parabolic projectivity. And we can write that simply as a projectivity from ACC to BCC, because it's a special case of the hyperbolic projectivity where C and F are the same place. So, just to reiterate what that means, that means that a parabolic projectivity, that's a projectivity with just one fixed point, is uniquely determined by giving that fixed point together with another point A and its image B, distinct image B, under the projection. So given point A, the distinct place it gets mapped to B, and the fixed point C, that's enough to completely determine how this parabolic projectivity works on every single point uh, on the range of this line which we're working on. And then another sort of result which follows from this is rather interesting. It says that the product of two parabolic projectivities which have the same invariant point is either going to be another parabolic projectivity or it's going to be the identity mapping in some degenerate cases. So there's only those two possibilities if we're doing the composition of two parabolic projectivities which have the same fixed point. And we can see this by sort of noting that such a parabolic projectivity can always be written as ACC is projected to BCC. Now the reason is as follows. We know that we're going to have these two parabolic projectivities that have the same fixed point. So the composition of these two projectivities has to be another projectivity, which has to have at least one fixed point. So already we know that it either has to be parabolic, hyperbolic, or the identity, um, given that it has either one, two, or, sorry, parabolic, hyperbolic, or the identity, yes, given as to whether it has one, two, or more invariance points, respectively. So we know that already. So all we have to really do is show that it's impossible for the product of these two projectivities to actually be a hyperbolic projectivity. So we'll do something a bit like a reducto absurdium argument to show this. Let's suppose that in addition to point C, let's suppose that there's another point A, which is actually invariant under these two projectivities. Well, in that case, 
these individual projectivities just have one fixed point. So the first projectivity must send A to some point B. But the net effect of these projectivities is to leave point A invariant. So the second projectivity has to send B back to point A. So in other words, the first projectivity has to look like, well, it'd be written as ACC maps to BCC, just like this one here at the bottom right. And the second projectivity must have the form BCC maps to ACC because it must undo the change we made to point A. Um, but the problem with that is we can see instantly then that the composition of those two projectivities is actually just the identity. It doesn't move anything at all. So we're forced to have the identity once we have the, the composition of these two projectivities has more than one invariance point. So there we go. Okay, so a nice way to summarize our discussion about composing together two parabolic projectivities is to have a look at this kind of figure here. And so we see that if we compose together a projectivity ACC to A dash CC and a projectivity A dash CC to A double dash CC, of course that's going to give us a projectivity ACC to A double dash CC. Now, our notation is quite convenient here because A dash would be the image of point A under this parabolic projectivity and A double dash would be the image of point A dash and A triple dash is the image of A double dash and so forth. And so what we can actually do is we can if we sort of iterate our parabolic perspectivity by repeatedly applying it to a point A, so we get A and then A dash and then A double dash and so forth, um, well, we can see what kind of relationship those points have. So we can do that by composing together these different parabolic projectivities. And what we find out is that we actually get a harmonic set of points, a harmonic sequence. So in particular we can keep generating the next point, A double dash. Well A double dash can be created by, in this figure, drawing a line from, sorry, a, um, we'll start from here, okay? So we generate A double dash by creating this new point by joining A dash to R and then drawing a line from Q through that new point and seeing where that meets the horizontal line, AC. And that gives us our point A double dash. And then we just repeat this kind of process. It's really completely analogous to the way we generated harmonic sequences in a previous discussion. So we draw another line from A double dash up through R, find out the point that, that crosses through the line C, S, and then draw another line back from Q through that point. That gives us the next point in our sequence, A triple dash. And so these points, A, A dash, A double dash, A triple dash, are respectively formed by more and more iterations of our initial parabolic projectivity. And so one way we can say this is that essentially our parabolic projectivity maps CC A A dash A double dash to CC A dash A double dash A triple dash. We're sort of winding on the number of dashes by one on the, uh, on the uh, notation for the A's here. So that's fairly interesting because it gives us a connection between harmonic nets and parabolic projectivities. And 
if we look at this kind of diagram more closely, we should see that we're actually getting a completed harmonic net here. Sorry, a completed harmonic set associated with our parabolic projectivity. So much as previously we showed that in general when we have a hyperbolic projectivity which is a more abundant and naturally occurring type I suppose um, that's equivalent so having this hyperbolic projectivity this is our previous algebraic argument so this projectivity here sends AECF to BDCF so there's that projectivity existing if and only if the three pairs A, D, B, E and C, F make a quadrangular set. So that's the more kind of general result. But the specific result is actually when we have the parabolic case. So we have the parabolic case, and in particular when B is equal to E and C is equal to F, well, in that case, our diagram collapses down. I haven't shown it here, but perhaps you'd like to uh, pause the video and see if you can demonstrate this yourself. But in this special case, which can be constructed, we, its existence shows that we have that there's going to be this parabolic projection ABCC to BDCC if and only if BC and AD together form a harmonic set. So this is the special case where the line which we're sectioning off the quadrangular set by actually passes through two diagonal points of our of our quadrangle, complete quadrangle. So we can look at the implications of this um, with regard to our discussion of iterating the parabolic projectivity. And a nice way to summarize it then is that we have at this projectivity, which we can just write as a projectivity from, well, in general, a projectivity from A, A dash C to A dash A double dash C is going to be parabolic when we have that H A dash C A A double dash. So that's when the pairs A dash C and A A double dash form a harmonic set. And if that's not the case, then the projectivity is actually going to be hyperbolic. So what we find here is a way to um, characterize whether our projectivity is hyperbolic or parabolic in terms of whether or not or what yeah whether or not our um, set of points forms a harmonic relationship or not so another way to say this last statement here is that a parabolic projectivity ACC to A dash CC is actually just going to be one that transforms A dash into the harmonic conjugate of A with respect to A dash and C. So we can actually say what the what the image of A dash is in terms of harmonic conjugates you know and harmonic sets. So it's very interesting how deep these different relationships are. Okay then, so next we're going to move on to a discussion of involutions. But before I get onto that topic, there's a theorem which we're going to rely on when we're talking about involutions, which is a concept I'll define in a minute. And um, I can't quite recall whether I did discuss this result um, within the first couple of lectures of this course or not, but it certainly won't hurt to go over it again if I did. So it's a theorem that says that if we have four collinear points, then we can always find a projectivity to interchange them in pairs. So if we have these four points A, B, C, D in a line, then we can find a projectivity that swaps around the positions of A and B 
and swaps around the positions of C and D. So we can kind of switch around these points in two pairs. And the proof is basically just a construction. So the way we construct this projectivity is we start by just putting a generic point R anywhere outside of this line AB. And also we'll draw a edge through this point D, this purple dotted edge in this case. And then all we do is we draw edges AR, BR and CR through this new point R and the vertices A, B and C. And then we'll mark the places where those new edges cut our dotted line as T, Q and W. So T is where this line through D meets AR and Q is where that line meets BR and W is where that line meets CR. And then we'll just get one extra point, which we'll call Z. That's going to be the meet of AQ and CR. So that's all the points we need. Now we can use this geometric setup to define our projectivity, which is going to be a projectivity from A, B, C, D to B, A, D, C. And we'll just do this as a sequence of perspectivity. So if you, you might need to pause the video and just study this diagram for a while, but hopefully you should be able to verify that if we start with A, B, C, D, then we do a perspectivity about center Q. We can send A to Z, B to R, C to W, sorry, C to C, and D to W. So that's sending A, B, C, D to Z, R, C, W. And then doing another perspectivity about center A, send Z, R, C, W to Q, T, D, W. And then we can do yet another perspectivity, this time about point R, and that will send QTDW to BADC. So the composition of these three perspectivities is going to be a projectivity which maps ABCD to BADC. And that's what we want. We want to swap around these things in pairs. So given the existence of that, we'll just bear this in mind, this nice little theorem. And we're going to rely on it in a second when we start thinking about involutions. Okay then, so involutions were one of the many new concepts which de Zarg introduced. Now, his work was not quite so well accepted during his, during his era. Um, and one of the reasons is probably because he introduced so many new pieces of terminology along with his kind of foundations of projective geometry. And actually, involution is one of the few terms he introduced, which still survives to this day. Now, he originally defined involutions in terms of metric notions like distances and such. But later on, von Stout, the uh, famous and prolific German projective geometer, um, found a definition of the involution which is completely independent of all such metric concepts and it's quite elegant so we'll use his definition which is that an involution is a projectivity which interchanges any given pair of points sorry it, it interchanges any point with its image so if x gets sent to x dash then x dash gets sent to x for every point x. Since in this lecture we're just um, restricting our attention to one dimensional projections, we can just think of this in terms of every point holding for every point x within the range of the line which we we're operating on. That's a, a big enough uh, domain for us to work in. Anyway, the remarkable fact is that this definition 
which we're um, insisting has to hold for every single point x on our line. In fact, we don't need to be so stringent because it just so happens that if this holds for a single point x and its image x dash on our line, then in fact it'll hold for every single point x on our line. So it just so happens that if this property holds anywhere, then it has to hold everywhere. So it's a remarkable fact which so it's a remarkable fact fact that so it's a remarkable fact that if this property holds for any point x, it has to actually hold for all points x. So how can we see this? Well, firstly, let's just suppose we have our projectivity and it sends a generic point x to a point x dash. Now, we're going to suppose that it interchanges points A and A dash. So this projectivity sends A to A dash and A dash to A. And now, we're going to attempt to show that it has to actually interchange every point with its image. So in particular, it has to map X dash back to X. So how do we show this? Well, firstly, we can write that our projectivity sends a a dash x to a dash a x dash that's just a consequence of it swapping around a and a dash and sending x to x dash now there's something interesting to note here uh, which is really a kind of trivial consequence of our fundamental theorem of projective geometry and that is that since we know how this projectivity works by sending a to a dash a dash to a and x to x dash. Well, we know how it works on three distinct collinear points, and we know how it sends those to three other distinct collinear points. So, according to the fundamental theorem, that's enough information to uniquely specify our projectivity. In other words, there's only going to be one kind of projectivity which works like this. So now we're going to construct such a projectivity, and we can do that just using our previous theorem. So obviously a a dash x x dash is going to be projective to a a dash x x dash. That's just by using the identity projection. But what we can actually do with our previous theorem is we can swap around the order of those two pairs. So we can use that result, that construction, to find a projectivity, a new projectivity, which sends a a dash x x dash to a dash a x dash x so this happens by switching round these two pairs and so this is a, another projectivity then which sends a to a dash and it sends a dash to a and it sends x to x dash so again according to our fundamental theorem of projectivity we know that there's only one projection which works like that so this new projection has to be identical to our old projection by the fundamental theorem. Now, what happens then is that we know that this new theorem has to be, we know that this new, new projectivity has to be identical to our old one. And this new one obviously interchanges x and x dash. In addition to sending x to x dash, it sends x dash to x. So, since this works for generic x, this proves our result. If a involution interchanges one pair of points, it, it interchange, if a map projectivity interchanges one pair of points, it interchanges all pairs of points. We have the, the projectivity that sends a to a dash and b to b dash and a dash to a, that projectivity has to be an involution. And that involution is really uniquely determined just by specifying a, a dash, and b, and b dash. So it's convenient then to write an involution, denote an involution, by a pair of bracketed pairs. The first pair, a, a dash, are two points that get interchanged, and the second pair, b, b dash, 
are two other points that get interchanged. Now, this notation will allow for the possibility that b might equal b dash. So in that case, we'd write the involution as a a dash bracketed off and then b b bracketed off. So in general, we'll denote a involution as two bracketed pairs like this. Now, what we're going to do is go back to our example of the quadrangular sets from before. And you may recall that, in particular when we were describing how to construct a hyperbolic projectivity, we happened across this fact that if the three pairs AD, BE, CF of collinear points form a quadrangular set, then that implies the existence of this projectivity, which sends AE, CF, to BDCF. So this is just what we discussed before, but the interesting thing we can add to it now is we can do a little involution on the end of this projectivity. So we'll take BDCF and switch around the two pairs of points there as an involution. So, in other words, we'll send BDCF to DBFC. And if we have a look at the net effect of those two projected projectivities composed, the net effect is to send AECF to DBFC. So this is fairly interesting now because you should note that what this sort of composite projectivity achieves is it interchanges points C and F. And so then, according to our previous theorem, the fact that it interchanges two points is enough to ensure that it is an involution, in fact. So not only are we taking a projectivity and composing it with an involution, the resultant projectivity is itself also an involution. And in particular, it's going to be a very interesting involution that sends points A, B, and C to points D, E, and F. We can see that because, well, we know that this involution exchanges points C and F. And we also know that it sends point E to point B. Well, that infers, since it's an involution, that it must also send point B to point E. It interchanges B and E. So we can write it as BECF, this composite mapping. But also, we could write it in other ways as well, by noting other ways which this mapping works on different pairs of points. So another form we could write it in is CFAD, or we could also write this involution as ADBE. So gathering all this information together, we get a fairly interesting conclusion which is that, in general, we're going to have the, these three pairs, AD, BE, and CF, form a quadrangular set, if and only if the projectivity that sends ABC to DEF is an involution. I realise I haven't given a completely airtight argument for this, for this as an if and only if statement, uh, so I invite you to sort of pause this video and fill in the gaps in this argument. But if you have a look at the diagram, you can see that this is really quite a natural idea. I mean, um, AD are both formed by opposite edges of the quadrangle, and BF... sorry, BE, are also formed by opposite edges of the quadrangle, as are C, C and F. So these points naturally fall into these three pairs. And it's very interesting that the fact that there are quadrangular sets is necessary and equivalent for there to be an involution which sends, well, which essentially makes this correspondence um, represented by these three pairs. So, 
another way to say this, a more kind of long-winded and less algebraic way to say it, is that three pairs of opposite sides of a complete quadrangle meet any line, well, a line not through a vertex, a section like this, they meet that line in three pairs of an involution, always. And also conversely, if we have any three collinear points, along with their mates for some given involution. So we have these three points along with the things that those three points get sent to under some involution. That's six points and those will form a quadrangular set. So today we've used this diagram already to discuss hyperbolic projectivities. But we first came across this construction when we were thinking earlier about how you can find the sixth point F of a quadrangular set given the first five points, A, B, C, D and E. Now we can think of that a new way around because essentially what we've shown here is that this um, this method, this method of creating this diagram, which is a method of finding F given points A, B, C, D and E, well, we can alternatively think of that as given that there's an involution which interchanges A and D and interchanges B and E, well, we could ask what is the mate of point C under this involution? What is the point that C gets interchanged with under this involution? And that would be, of course, be the point F. And so, creating this picture, we can alternatively think of it as a method of finding the mate of point C under our involution, which switches round points A and D and switches round points B and E. So, an important consequence of this result then is that we're going to have that CF is going to be a pair of the involution that switches AD and BE. If and only if we're going to have that there is a projection from AECF to BDCF as we find here. So in general we can write an involution as two of these are called pairs of involution AD and BE but if there exist these other projectivities, then we can use that information to find further pairs of involution. OK, so let's write this again with a change of symbols. So just changing the symbols now, we have the same statement is that MN is going to be a pair of the involution A, B dash, A dash, B, that is, the involution which switches round A and B dash and A dash and B, if and only if there is this projectivity that sends A A dash M N to B B dash M N. So also now we can see that there's another way to write that down because that's going to hold if and only if there is a projectivity which sends ABMM to A dash B dash MN. So hopefully if you pause the video and think about it for a while, you can see that this kind of logic implies that if a pair of points is a pair of two different involutions then we can kind of mix those two involutions together and that pair will also belong to the resulting involution. So let me be a bit more specific. Suppose MN is a pair of the involution which switches round A and A dash and switches round B and B dash. And also suppose that this pair happens to also be a member of a pair of the involution which switches A and A1 and B and B1. Well in that case this kind of logic implies that 
MN has to be a pair of the involution which switches A dash with B1 and B dash with A1. So all of this can be inferred just by looking at our previous discussion about taking the hyperbolic projectivity and doing a composition of it with an involution. So this is the general case then when M and N are distinct. But notice that all of this logic also holds for the case where M equals N. So in that special case then when N and M coincide, instead of a hyperbolic projectivity we're going to have a parabolic projectivity. And in that case, that parabolic projectivity obviously just has one invariant point, and that point will be m. And so m is going to be a fixed point of the involution with pairs a a dash and b b dash. It'll be a fixed point of the involution with pairs a a one and b b one. It'll also be a fixed point of the involution with pairs a dash b one and b dash a one. Okay, so we've seen a lot of interesting relationships so far. But I think this next result is particularly fascinating. It says that any one-dimensional projectivity at all can be written as the product of two involutions. And the proof is remarkably short. So if we have an involution, sorry, a projectivity, which sends A, B, and C to A dash, B dash, and C dash, well, you can see for yourself that that projectivity actually just corresponds to the product of the involution A, B dash, B, A dash. So that's the involution which swaps around A and B dash and B and A dash. And the involution which swaps around A dash and B and C dash and D, where D is just the mate of C within the involution, that first involution, which has pairs A, B dash and B, A dash. So you can check that one for yourself. And it's very interesting then that we can actually redo all of our discussion about these one-dimensional projectivities completely in terms of involutions. Okay, so it turns out that one fruitful question is, how many fixed points does a given involution have? So let's just consider a generic involution which has a fixed point B. So say it sends B, C, C dash to B, C dash, C. And also, we have this point B, so let's let A be the harmonic conjugate of B with respect to this corresponding pair, C and C dash. Now, it follows from our previous result that these sets, A, B, C, C dash, and A, B, C dash, C, are going to be harmonic sets, which are related by this unique projectivity, in particular the projectivity that sends a, B, C, C dash to A, B, C dash, C. So that's a projectivity that switches round um, points C and C dash and leaves B fixed. So our fundamental theorem of projective geometry implies that that is actually a uniquely specified projectivity that has to be equal to the projectivity that we're talking about initially. So in other words, that has to be equal to the thing we started off talking about, the thing that sends BCC dash to BC dash C. So that's fairly interesting because what it implies then is that if we have any involution which has an invariant point B, then it's going to have another invariant point A, which is going to be the harmonic conjugate of B with respect to any pair of points. So this is a, a very interesting result, which implies that an involution is either going to be 
elliptic or hyperbolic. It can't be parabolic. It can't have just one fixed point because we're always going to have these pairs of fixed points which are harmonic conjugates to one another. So there's going to be this involution which um, has these two fixed points A and B which are harmonic conjugates to, to one another. And a nice way to denote that kind of involution is just by giving the pairs A, A and B, B because it sends A to A and B to B because A and B are its two invariant points. So this gives us a very nice alternative way to think about harmonic conjugates in general because what we have now is that for any three points A, B and C we can think of a harmonic conjugate of C with respect to points A and B to just be the mate of C with respect to this involution that sends A to A and B to B. So it's really quite a remarkable new way to think about harmonic sets in general. And then if we have a look at the special case of this, where C is actually coinciding with, let's say, A, or it could be B, but let's say A. Um, well, in that case, we have that any point is going to be its own harmonic conjugate with respect to itself and any other point. So this usage of involutions is allowing us to go further into the kind of definition of harmonic conjugates themselves.